Right, I'm going to take um, a slightly different perspective. Uh, my background is very much, as well as instrumental data and data sets, is in climate variability and climate change. So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is the contribution of the Ratcliffe data set to central England temperature. And central England temperature is the longest instrumental data in the world, but it's a composite data set. So the Ratcliffe is from one station, central England is from many stations, it starts in 1659, and as you heard Tim say, there are no ob uh, instrumental observations in 1659. So some of the early data, although it's nominally quantitative, is actually reconstructed from diaries and things like that. And we'll I won't mention a lot about that, but that's the work of Gordon Manley. And then finally, I'm going to show you how we can use the Ratcliffe Observatory data, even though it's in one station. This actually slightly surprised me to cast quite a lot of light on the relationship between synoptic variability in the North Atlantic and temperature and some other parameters uh, at, at Oxford itself. So, uh, it, it's, so it's more useful than I thought. So there's the observatory. Uh, there is uh, the site, uh, which, as, uh, as Tim said, is a fairly constricted site that's probably uh, actually changed quite a lot over time. <laughs> And here, just to overlap with Tim's talk, is a book of observations from the Ratcliffe Observatory in March 1773. Uh, there were temperature data in those days, but they're incomplete. And so uh, the complete data only starts, as Tim says, in 1814. Though I dare say some use actually could be made of that earlier data. That's Gordon Manley. Gordon Manley is very famous in meteorology for the central England temperature data set. This was a tremendous effort over decades. And in, the, in those days, it was before global climate change uh, existed as a, a, a viable uh, study. People, many people thought the climate was constant. So Gordon actually pioneered uh, this work at a time when this sort of work wasn't very fashionable. And we are now very grateful in the days of climate change that he actually did this all those years ago. He was also president of the Royal Meteorological Society, and he wrote papers, as you can see on that slide, from 1946 up to 1974 on this topic. Um, the first paper in 1946 uh, didn't include the Ratcliffe data, but central England temperature tries to represent something like the Midlands, but there aren't enough data in the, the true Midlands, so what he did he took data from the Lancashire region and from the Oxford region and averaged them together to represent the Midlands. So that's why it's, it is central England temperature, but it covers everything from the Lancashire Plains down to, down to the Radcliffe Ob Ob Observatory. Uh, then in 1953, uh, this was uh, the first monthly central England temperature paper which combined the Lancashire data with the Radcliffe data. And uh, you can see on that graph uh, Lancashire, and there are lots of stations there. Those, those places are just to give you a geographical perspective. It's basically uh, the area was to the west of Halifax and, and Salford, uh, between there and, and the coast. And you can see Oxford. And so that's the sort of range of central England temperature. <laughs> And this is his most famous paper in 1974, uh, which published the full central England temperature data from 1659 to 1973. And the central England temperature data actually is quoted and used throughout the whole world. And I'll show you some very surprising reasons why that might be so right at the end of the lecture. It's not only the longest temperature data set, it's also surprisingly useful uh, and in a much wider context. And thanks to Tim, uh, these are uh, uh, Gordon Manley's original uh, manuscript diagrams showing, uh, summarizing what he had achieved. Uh, I think these are different s seasonal. There's, there's the winter at the top, spring, summer, autumn, and the year. So don't worry about that because we can see things much more clearly afterwards. But that is itself 
a historical document as quite as much as some of the Radcliffe data themselves. Now one of the problems with the Radcliffe data is that it is subject to urbanization. The city has grown, the site has also changed somewhat, so when the work was done to try and up, update the Ratcliffe uh, work uh, and its application to central England temperature, which we did in the Met Office, we had to take a very close look at this problem. We also wanted, if we could, to create a daily uh, central England temperature data set back as far as possible. This is very valuable for looking at synoptic variability remembering that the central England temperature is actually monthly, even though the Ratcliffe Observatory, of course, itself has an, uh, daily data going back quite a long way. So we had a lot of difficulty because we couldn't really find daily data uh, back as far as you wanted to go uh, uh, in the Lancashire area and uh, in the Oxford region. So we used a whole variety of other stations. You can see some of them in Black, Linden, I think that's uh, in, in Rutland, Cambridge, and more recently, more recent years, Malvern and Squires Gate. And we managed to extend the daily central and temperature record back to 1772. But we could only use the Ratcliffe record um, in, uh, up to 1973. So this is the daily central England temperature record from 1772 to 1991. It's kept up to date by the Hadley Centre on a daily basis, actually. It's actually updated in real time. So you can see what's happening to central England temperature today, uh, what happened yesterday, uh, which is very valuable for lots of applications. Uh, but we cannot include the Ratcliffe data uh, after 1973. And in a later paper, that this is the last paper that was written on central England temperature in 2005 by David Parker and Brian Horton, they compared the Ratcliffe Observatory uh, uh, minimum temperatures to the daily central England temperature minimum temperatures. Now, when urbanisation takes place, you get that the heat actually comes partly from the buildings, but quite a lot of it actually comes from the concrete surfaces, the roads, etc. And it's the heat released at night that actually causes the major problem. So it's the, the nighttime temperature that suffers from urbanization much more than the daytime temperature. So if you want to detect urbanization, you should look at the nighttime temperatures. And you can see uh, that that graph is the Ratcliffe Observatory relative to the minimum daily central England temperature, which itself is corrected for some urbanization. And you can see a rise of about half a degree since the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century. And most of that's taken place since about 1960. Um, I don't think we fully understand the, 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 the cause of the exact shape of that curve. I think it is quite complicated. Uh, Oxford has grown, but I suspect site changes may contribute and so you can see, even up to 1973, central England temperature probably might have a small amount of uncorrected urbanization, but it'd only be small. Now, what, we've done, what I've done next is to look at what the uh, central England temperature and the Ratcliffe Observatory temperature record can tell us about climate change, actually, in central England and at Oxford. So on the left-hand side scale, you'll see temperature anomalies, that's temperature differences for an average over the last 30 years, 1981 to 2010. And the central England temperature record is uh, red, and the Ratcliffe Observatory record is, is blue. And these are the annual means of the day and the night. And the first thing you can see, if you look at the blue record, uh, it parallels central England temperature up to about 1960, and then, it overtake, and then it catches up with it. And that's a sign that the Ratcliffe Observatory temperatures have warmed more than the central England temperature, which has little urbanization. So, and you can see that the uh, amount is 
several tenths of a degree. So when you average the minimum and the maximum, it's probably about half, 0.3 degrees, which shows you that actually the maximum temperatures are probably okay. They probably don't suffer from urbanization. It's the minimum temperatures. And you can see the sharp rise in temperature in the last 40 years or so uh, from uh, minus 0.5 relative to uh, 1981 to 2010 up to about 0.3 degrees above. So there's been a rise of about 0.8 degrees centigrade in central England temperature and one degree in the Ratcliffe in the last 50 years or so. And that really is quite strong warming. And as Tim has said, it's actually had quite a big effect on what people can grow. Not only vines, and there's a magnificent vineyard near where I used to live in the South Chilterns, which produces excellent white wine. I don't fully rec recommend some of the red wines that are produced in Devon. Uh, we had a party one day, and it was a bit of a disaster <laughs> when we bought a very expensive bottle of red wine from a, a, a vineyard north of Exeter. But something else you can grow very well nowadays is maize. And maize wasn't viable in England uh, till about 30 or 40 years ago, because you need most summers to get a good crop to make it uh, financially viable. And there are papers in the, that the Met Office have written about this. And so maize is now very much commercially viable, even on the high Chilterns. There was a field literally next to our house, 600 feet above sea level, growing maize quite successfully in the 1990s. 2014, go back, the last point on that graph is 2014. The warmest year, you can see the Ratcliffe just point, pokes up as blue above the red, slight, slightly warmer. And um, there's one of the Ratcliffe observers on the telephone to Radio Oxford on 9.15 a.m. on the 1st of January 2015 to tell the world <laughs> what had happened at this great event. And indeed, um, it, it, it was. So we have just had the warmest year on record. And one of the surprising things about 2014, there were no, it, there were no extreme temperatures. It was just uniformly warm all the time for a whole variety of reasons, which I haven't got time to go into, but you could ask. So it's a sign of what might happen in the future. We don't have to have great extremes. The, the whole record can just lift up. The whole statistical distribution of temperatures can just rise as a whole. You don't need a big change in the extremes, though that may happen as well, but it didn't happen in 2014. In the top diagram, I show you in blue the rise of minimum temperatures and uh, it, Ratcliffe and the rise in central England minimum temperatures. And again, you can see the problem uh, that there is a... a they, they were f f f this is relative to 1981 to 2010. They were pretty well parallel until 1960, and then they joined together. And so we've had a rise in the minimum temperatures, and below is the maximum temperatures. And there you can see uh, central England and Ratcliffe. I mean, there are slight differences in detail, but they've gone together, essentially. So the Ratcliffe is a pretty good measure of the way that maximum temperatures have risen in central England. So it's a very valuable record. And in fact, it's worth pointing out that temperatures in one place are actually very highly correlated with temperatures in another place over the United Kingdom. So you have to go a long way away from, Rat from the Ratcliffe Observatory before the temperature changes that you get, rather than the mean temperatures, which vary a lot across the country, actually vary very much. It's not the case. Rainfall is much more complicated. So the Ratcliffe Observatory record on its own can be surprisingly useful on its own, even though it's one site. The last thing I want to point out before I go on to climate variability is although the Ratcliffe Observatory suffers from urban warming, this could be quite valuable in future because the climate change that the majority of our population will suffer is the general climate change plus the urban warming. And there's now work going on in the Met Office to model these effects in detail. And this will become a big topic, I'm sure, over the next 20 or 30 years. So if you can correct for very local site changes, the Ratcliffe Observatory, together with London, various London records, 
various other records in big cities, could become especially valuable in its own right. And the fact it suffers some urbanization could be a positive advantage. And that's often not pointed out when these sorts of talks are done. So there is uh, the winter, um, and central England is in red. Uh, the Arachnid Observatory is in blue, and this is the mean temperature, so there's a bit of urban warming at the end. First of all, the, s the straight red line is the trend in central England temperature. And you can see over the last two centuries, taking the simplistic view of a straight line, there's been a rise of one degree centigrade. But what's much more interesting are the wobbles in that curve. And they're really ma they're major wobbles over a century. So if you look at the dip around about 1890, when they both dipped together, there was a rise up to about 1920. Uh, then there was a fall until the 1970s, and then a rise since then, and a bit of a, a flattening. So is that chance, or is it due to something? And you can notice at the bottom of that fall is the great winter of 1962-63, after which the warming restarted. Why was that? Well, a lot of the cause of that, as I will show you in a minute, is uh, weather variability. Now, the most important weather pattern that exists that affects the United Kingdom in the winter is the North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation measures the strength and frequency of the westerly winds that blow from the Atlantic uh, from the Atlantic to Western Europe. And in the positive phase, uh, the storms tend to go over into the north of the UK, bringing in westerly winds, warmth from the uh, Atlantic over the Ratcliffe Observatory. In the negative phase, the storms tend to go into the Mediterranean much more. And we get an increased frequency of easterly winds. And this is, accounts for about half of the weather variability that affects Oxford, or Wallingford for that matter. Uh, and you can measure it in a very simple way, and this is almost unbelievable, but if you just take the pressure difference between Iceland and the Azores, that measures it perfectly, almost perfectly. There are other ways of doing it. So this is a major uh, fluctuation in the atmosphere, and it could be measured very simply. And we've got data uh, from of these areas are going back to the early 19th century. So how does the Ratcliffe Observatory record compare with the Winter North Atlantic Oscillation? So the Winter North Atlantic Oscillation strength is measured in red, and the Ratcliffe Observatory temperatures are measured in blue. And what I've done is a, is a sort of trick we do in climatology, because they're very different measures of different things, we've brought them to the same scale, so the variability of both is the same. This is known as standardization for the guests here. So we can plot the graphs on the same scale. And you can see uh, that uh, although towards the end of the curve, the, red, the blue curve doesn't quite follow the red curve because of global warming, uh, there's a substantial similarity. In fact, the correlation of the uh, winter values, not the smooth curve, but winter values, is 0.71. That's half the variance. So uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation explains half the variance of the Radcliffe Observatory temperatures in the winter. And not only that, you'll notice that, in fact, the warming in the last few decades has not been very great in central England temperature in the winter. So the win actually winter shows the least warming of all the seasons, and it's dominated by synoptic variability. So if you look towards the end of the record, you'll see in central, in, in, in the winter North Atlantic Oscillation, a big, a ne huge negative blob. And you'll see in the blue curve, uh, a smaller negative blob. That was the uh, winter uh, of 2010-11. We had the, the coldest December since 1895. Of course, by a, a, a negative North Atlantic Oscillation, uh, almost entirely easterly winds from uh, Russia and, and, and Siberia caused that winter. And that's the North Atlantic Oscillation. Down the bottom uh, is a, it's a parameter we haven't discussed so far as the wind speed. This is the Ratcliffe wind speed. It turns out that in the westerly phase uh, from the Atlantic, the winds tend to be strong. In the easterly phases, when you get high pressure, 
and winds from the east, they tend to be weak. And you can see the, wind to, the winds at the Ratcliffe Observatory, though it's a, an urban site, you might think it's not very reliable, and we know there may be some problems right at the end, um, uh, follow each other very well. And by the way, these smooth curves are all 20-year 20 20 running means. So uh, that is another uh, indication that uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation actually <coughs> controls Ratcliffe Observatory winds, something that perhaps is not often discussed. Uh, it's very of great interest to the energy industry because, as I'm going to show you some new results in a minute, They're, they are very much affected by the winds around the British Isles in the winter. Uh, if the turbines don't, uh, don't turn, they don't generate much electricity. So uh, wind turbines are highly sensitive to the winter North Atlantic Oscillation when a lot of the electricity, of course, is generated because the winds are strongest in the winter. Now, we've had a, break, a big breakthrough in the last uh, two years in uh, forecasting the winter North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, until recently, this was thought to be impossible. Um, the winter North Atlantic Oscillation, because it's something in the stormy North Atlantic, fantastic variability, was thought to be completely unpredictable beyond the time scale of weather forecasting, so a week ahead. But that turns out not actually to be true. And so on, on that graph, uh, in black, is the nor winter North Atlantic Oscillation in this standardized scale. And in, the, in, in blue, that the solid blue line, are hindcasts from the latest climate model of the winter North Atlantic Oscillation. And all the little blobs are individual members. We have to run the medal many, many times. And so the, red, the blue is the average. And the correlation is, is, is over 0.6. And when you get a correlation of over 0.6, all the, all the users start to get interested because that's a rough measure of, of, of the threshold of usefulness to society of uh, a forecast. So um, these forecasts are now regarded as useful. And this is developing new commercial opportunities for the Met Office. Uh, and this is all published in geophysical research letters in April 2014. So going back to the Ratcliffe Observatory, um, extreme cold month was December 2010. Uh, you can see the scale there, the darker the blue, the colder it was. And you can see Oxford uh, on the Thames there uh, was just outside the coldest area relative to normal. These are relative to normal, but it was quite close. And the lowest temperature actually was minus 10.9. But note that was nothing like as low as in the great winter of 1947. Uh, the, the, the reason for that probably is not so much global warming as a little component of that. But 1947 had continuous deep snow for a much longer period than December uh, uh, 2010. Nevertheless, it was the lowest temperature uh, for, for a long time, I think for several decades that has been recorded at the Ratcliffe. And there's urbanization, of course. And this is December 2010. On the right-hand side is the snow cover. And you can see uh, where the Ratcliffe is right in the middle of that snow-covered area. Uh, only Cornwall wasn't, wasn't snow-covered. Um, that, that top picture might be, have me in that plane. I, I was, that's the British Airways plane. I think that's the, one, the last one that landed from San Francisco to London. And we landed in the blinding snowstorm, and the airport was closed three minutes later for the next five days. So that's a pretty dramatic introduction to the winter of 2010 for me. And there's a, a Waitrose van <laughs> who went a bit too fast in, De in Devon uh, for the conditions. And coming on to the summer now, uh, this is the Ratcliffe Observatory June to August temperatures. Uh, the mean temperature is in, in, in black, the minimum temperature is in blue, and the maximum in, in red. And you see again, uh, <coughs> not as much warming perhaps as you see in the annual mean. Uh, the minimum temperatures and the maximum temperatures have not followed exactly the same uh, course. This is almost certainly due to atmospheric circulation. Uh, I haven't actually looked at that in great detail. Uh, so that would, that would bear some, some looking at. But we can relate to some extent these values to atmospheric circulation. Now in the winter, 
I mentioned the, the winter North Atlantic Oscillation. In the summer, there is a summer North Atlantic Oscillation, but it's somewhat different. Uh, in the winter, you can measure the North Atlantic Oscillation by the difference in pressure between Iceland and the Azores. Um, if it's positive, the Azores is high pressure and the uh, Iceland is low pressure. Uh, in the summer, it's very much more the UK versus Greenland. So in the positive phase of the summer North Atlantic Oscillation, all those s solid lines, uh, that's uh, high pressure anticyclonic conditions over the UK to Scandinavia and low pressure over Greenland. And that's very strongly related to rainfall below. And you can see the correlation scale on the bottom. And you see the colors and the correlations. That's the negative correlations. So when it's anticyclonic, positive, summer North Atlantic Oscillation, it's dry. So this is a, a drought pattern. And the, the correlations, negative correlations, exceed 0 0.6 uh, over reasonable sized areas. Now, over the Ratcliffe Observatory, you wouldn't expect the correlations to be so high because at one position, uh, you're much more in the hands of individual thunderstorms, whereas if you average over a region, you know, you're average over lots of storms and it, it smooths things out. Nevertheless, we do get quite a good relationship. Um, this is July and August, where we, at the moment, define the summer North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, the temperature correlation uh, is 0.49, uh, and that is caused by the fact that when the summer North Atlantic Oscillation is in its positive anticyclonic mode, there's lots of sunshine and it's warm. Uh, the rainfall I plotted as, as negative of the rainfall, just to, sh to show how it goes with the summer North Atlantic Oscillation, and the correlation is almost the same but negative, but minus 0.48, and the summer North Atlantic Oscillation there, of course, is in, in black. So we can explain rather less of the Ratcliffe record by the Summer North Atlantic Oscillation, but nevertheless, um, that's about 25% of the variance rather than the 50% of the variance. This is because summer weather patterns are much more variable than the winter weather patterns. That may surprise you, but that is the case. Though very recent work that I've done suggests that we can do a better job of the Summer North Atlantic Oscillation, and it might explain a bit more of the variance but not as much as in the winter. So an extreme warm month, which was a positive phase of the summer North Atlantic Oscillation and some other weather patterns as well. Uh, you'll re probably remember August 2003. That's, that's when the highest temperature ever recorded in Britain, 38.5 degrees centigrade, or in old money, it's over 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so, that, so that was in Kent. Uh, and the Ratcliffe uh, didn't get quite to those temperatures, but you got to 35.6, which is 96 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see the, the red blobs are the warmest areas, which were over, th which were over two and a half degrees above normal for that month, uh, mainly to the southeast of the Ratcliffe Observatory, the London area, and towards Kent. And just to, I live on Dartmoor. <laughs> it was a drought summer and autumn. And there's uh, the Fernworthy Reservoir, and what's exposed is the old bridge in Fernworthy Village, which was drowned uh, by the reservoir in 1942, the Clapper Bridge, and the Road Bridge. And that's not been seen since. I had a look in the drought of 2010-12, and that did not appear. So that shows you uh, how much... Uh, that wasn't a very long period, I don't think, but the temperatures made the, the effect of the decreased rainfall that much more severe because it was so warm. <coughs> F spring and autumn. Now, these have shown the most warming. Um, this is the, the pattern right back from 1815, 20-year running means and the annual values in spring and autumn. The three-month autumn, September to November. Spring is March to, to May. And you can see a lot, lots of interannual variability, but lots and lots of warming in the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, uh, over one degree. So uh, the, the lion's share, really, of the warming of central England temperature and the Ratcliffe Observatory really has come from spring and autumn. Um, the reason for that is not utterly clear, but uh, as I pointed out to you, in the other seasons, the weather patterns have a very large effect on the temperatures. 
Um, so this has not happened in the autumn. Uh, what's tended to happen, I think, is the weather patterns in the autumn ten and spring have tended to be warm weather patterns, and that's probably slightly added to the background effect of global warming, though there is no paper actually yet written on that subject. So, you know, you could use the Radcliffe Observatory record with central England temperature to write quite a nice little paper on that, uh, that topic. Finally, global warming. And this is quite surprising. Um, in the dotted line is the classical uh, global warming record. These are 10 year running means now, by the way, uh, of land and ocean. Now, the ocean warms slower than the land. So, uh, in the black, the black solid line is the global land. That's everywhere over land that we can measure temperature back to the mid 19th century. And we can make uh, estimates of uncertainty, but that's too much to put on there. Superimposed on that is central England temperature with the 10 year running mean and the Ratcliffe Observatory. Now we know the Ratcliffe Observatory has got a bit more warming due to urbanisation. So you just concentrate on central England temperature and although it fluctuates more because of weather patterns locally and there are some local effects in the Atlantic as well. The Atlantic temperatures don't always vary in the same way as the globe. Nevertheless, if you take out uh, the sort of multi-decadal variability, you'll see that central England and Ratcliffe Observatory, taking out the urbanisation, has fluctuated very much the same as the global mean. So those sceptics that don't believe in global mean temperature can't really believe in the Ratcliffe record either. <laughs> <laughs> and my last slide, I want to congratulate the uh, Richard and his predecessors, Tim, on maintaining this unique long record. Unfortunately that some of the other records have not been maintained like Kew Observatory and the Met Office closed that down. Um, and now we have 200 years of continuous meteorological observations and that's Miles Allen who's a well-known climatologist and he's got a bottle of something in his hand. I'm I imagine he's celebrating something, whatever it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>